Hey, what's good, self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great, and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital, and today we're going to recap this week in cannabis news from September 20th to the 26th. So before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity yourself, make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss any future videos, but then there's plenty of episodes for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so that you can watch episodes to learn about the evolution of the industry over time, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up and take advantage whenever you're ready. But we got some unexpected and positive news on Friday as a House committee will vote on federal cannabis legalization bill next week, this coming week, days after banking reform did in fact advance in the NDAA. So a bill to federally legalize cannabis will be voted on by the House Judiciary Committee next week, the panel announced on Friday. So this isn't a full U.S. House vote. This will be a vote in one of their committees, but it is good for bringing legalization awareness to the forefront as this development comes one day after the House voted in favor of a defense spending bill that includes an amendment that would protect banks that serve state legal cannabis businesses from being penalized by federal regulators. Judiciary Committee Chairman Gerald Nadler's Marijuana Opportunity, Reinvestment, and Expungement, also known as the Moore Act, will receive a markup on Wednesday. The panel will consider a dozen pieces of legislation during the meeting, according to a press release. And just to recap, this legislation would remove cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act. And ultimately, this is the other big thing that we're hoping on, because when we talk about safe plus something that might come in the spring, Removing cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act would allow for uplisting, and it would allow for all the things that we want because it would just essentially, in the flip of a switch, make cannabis a legal substance federally and not still an illegal substance. So just to add to that, there are a lot of options on how we can get this done over time, but allow people with cannabis convictions, it will also, sorry, but also allow people with cannabis convictions to have their records expunged and create a federal tax on cannabis with the revenue going to support community reinvestment and other programs, which is obviously something that we want for everyone who's been affected by this as well. It also contains language to create a pathway for resentencing for those incarcerated for cannabis offenses, protect immigrants from being denied citizenship over cannabis, and prevent federal agencies from denying public benefits or security clearance due to its use. So nonetheless, the fact that this, or that the NDAA got through with safe attached just shows how bipartisan safe is uh, as an issue that can be solved. Um, now, this is obviously just added extra, but from now until the spring, if we can see if we can get a better bill that has safe plus a few more of these things, I wouldn't be opposed. But again, that's because I want to free this plant more than I really want the money. I think the money's going to follow anyways. So just wanted to add all that, but that's great news that we saw on Friday. And this over to the National Law Review, I just wanted to add this as the latest on the National Defense Authorization Act. And while we know this passed with bipartisan support, I did find this in the article that I wanted to show you. On June 22nd, the Senate Armed Services Committee voted 23 to 3 to advance its version of the full year 2022 NDAA. The Senate has yet to release the SASC passed bill, but did release an executive summary. But at this point, it is expected that the SASC passed NDAA will be brought to the Senate floor the week of October 18th. So just wanted to show you this date, which is less than a month away, uh, a little over three weeks. But this is when we can possibly expect some talks in the Senate between the two NDAA bills, um, and when we can possibly expect Schumer or Booker to get in the way and do something silly um, for the Democratic Party if they choose to do so. So we have a date to look forward to. And on top of that, upon passage of their respective bills, congressional leaders from both chambers will meet to conference the final legislation through initial staff level discussions or pre-conferencing on especially controversial provisions in both bills that may have already begun. Timing for conference legislation is uncertain as prioritization of the NDAA depends on competing legislation such as federal funding, reconciliation, the debt limit, and infrastructure, but the passage of the annual defense bill is expected in both chambers with bipartisan support likely before the end of the year. So this is one option to look out for. There was also Safe language added to that minibus bill, which is expected to pass by the end of September 30th. Uh, I don't have an update on that, but just again to highlight that there are many ways to get this done, and it's just good that we're seeing more effort from those that can actually get it done, the lawmakers in Congress. On to some news though, as Amazon says time has come for US to legalize cannabis. I didn't know Amazon called the shots for America, but nonetheless, we do have Amazon to thank because that story probably wouldn't have happened if Amazon wasn't so open about their lobbying for the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act of 2021, a House bill that would end the federal ban on cannabis. The company also supports a recently introduced Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act, a similar bill proposed in the Senate. As pre-employment, cannabis testing disproportionately impacts people of color and acts as a barrier to employment, Gilletti wrote. We found that eliminating pre-employment testing for cannabis allows us to expand our applicant pool and hire more employees, she added as the company's June decision to scrap cannabis testing for hiring and firing. So we do have to thank Amazon for this. And just to add, we strongly believe the time has come to reform the nation's cannabis policy. And no doubt, the time has come, obviously 
seriously, and we are committed to helping lead the effort, Beth Giletti, Amazon Senior Vice President of Human Resources, wrote Tuesday in a post. Today's status quo is unfair and untenable, added Giletti again, also very true, who noted the difficulty for companies in creating cannabis rules for workers given the discrepancy between federal law and local statutes. So it does require some of these big companies that are more progressive to start you know, putting their money where their mouth is. And just another example to highlight the Washington Post is owned by Amazon, so thank you again, Mr. Bezos. As greener pastures, marijuana jobs are becoming a refuge for retail and restaurant workers. So just, it's good to get, to get this awareness out there because some publications need to do it and there are very few out there. You know, I feel like I'm one of the few, Marijuana Moments, one of the few, um, and only, you know, MSNBC, CBS, uh, and Washington Post, anything that's really progressive or sees this as a good thing are the only publications actually covering this. So just wanted to share a snippet from this. So after a year on the front lines, Jason Zvokal traded in his 15-year career uh, as a Walgreens pharmacist for a different kind of drugstore, a cannabis dispensary. Now, instead of administering vaccines and filling prescriptions, he's helping customers make sense of concentrates, tablets, and lozenges. His pay is 5% lower, he said, but the hours are more manageable. And I'm so much happier, says Vocal, 46, who's worked in retail since he was 18. For the first time in years, I'm not miserable when I come home from work. Well, that sounds like a positive. The cannabis industry is riding a pandemic high as cannabis dispensaries and cultivation deemed essential by many states at the beginning of the pandemic became an early refuge for retail and restaurant workers who had been furloughed or laid off. The industry has continued to grow adding nearly 80,000 jobs in 2020, more than double what it did the year before, according to data from the Leafly Jobs Report produced in partnership with Whitney Economics. An estimated 321,000 Americans now work in the cannabis industry, a 32% increase from last year, the report found, making legal cannabis one of the nation's fastest growing sectors. And again, this is a fact, it's just very few publications are putting this information out there. So the more that do, the better obviously for us. And in other words, the United States now has more legal cannabis workers than dentists, paramedic, or electrical engineers. So this is why we need to decriminalize it or at least just deschedule it from the CSA so we can start treating every cannabis employee the same as others. So rant over, but just good to show that, hey, thank you, Amazon, for getting the more act on the forefront in a House committee this week coming up. Now we're going to jump over to Twitter. Todd Harrison shares uh, this town hall takeaway from the uh, town hall they had on Tuesday. Now that link is still not available, but when it is, I will put it in the episode I did on Wednesday or this one. But he adds, safe banking has a fighter shot in the Senate, but industry stakeholders like Boris, who highlighted in the town hall, and I forgot to mention last episode, believe safe plus a better bill is likely in the spring. So this is what I'm referring to when I say safe plus coming in the spring could be safe and removing cannabis from the CSA, which would be worth waiting for in my view. You might not agree and that's okay, um, but that's something that I do believe. And again, I'm prepared to hold out for that. Um, but incremental Fed movement when, not if, again, according to Boris and Todd and many of us who've been paying attention to this, to supplement these superb state-driven fundamentals. But so again, just to highlight that safe in the NDAA is good, and that would likely allow for more investors to start investing in the cannabis space without fear of prosecution, which would be good for our share prices. But SAFE Plus, which would effectively be us possibly waiting until March or spring to get SAFE and removing cannabis from the CSA or expungement of records or something, obviously removing cannabis from the CSA, the Controlled Substances Act, would be the number one most important thing. But this is just the idea of SAFE plus a little something in the spring may be worth voting for. So not all hope is lost, but that is sort of what we can see if Schumer or Booker really do let their egos get in the way and they pull that out of the NDA. And just to add, there are zero reasons why both can't happen, which is 100% true. But again, like we're not the ones making these decisions. So it's hard to get worked up and you know waste energy over worrying about that. Take the win now and parlay the momentum into a large, broader next year win. Uh, it's called compromise. I 100% agree with what Synergy Canna Life is saying. Good old fashioned compromise where everyone gets something. It's for damn sure better than nothing. And yes, the idea is if they pull it out of the NDAA, but then they don't get safe plus, that's the risk that, they're, that they might be willing to take. I don't agree with that, but I'm just trying to bounce all these possible outcomes um, that we can foresee in the next six to 12 months. So hopefully that was informative, not just too much babbling. But on top of that, just to highlight that, yes, there are sadly those in Congress who supposedly are fighting for the people that want to block this incremental step, which would be positive uh, because, you know, they want what they want as opposed to what the American people want. Senator Cory Booker told me today he opposes adding Safe Banking Act to the NDAA. It's something that should not be included. It undermines the ability to get comprehensive cannabis reform uh, and the kind of things that are harder to get done, like expungement of people's records. Uh, I mean, that's one way to view it. He could also say that it's one step while you use the rest of your energy to work on getting that done. 
Um, and then she also adds, spokesperson for Majority Leader Chuck Schumer told me today that his position has not changed since he told Politico in April that banking and comprehensive reform should move at the same time. Here's that interview if you want to check that out. And then just to add, Senate likes to send NDAA amendments to a vote by unanimous consent. If one senator raises an objection to an NDAA amendment, it can kill or stall it. And Booker wouldn't discuss his plans because he doesn't have any plan as of yet, but he has a lot of options as an individual senator should the amendment be proposed. But my last thing to add is if Booker wants to step in front of this when it has bipartisan support from all the Republicans, good luck getting any sort of more comprehensive reform if you're not going to allow this through Booker. So that's the last thing I'd want to add to that. Uh, point being is we don't know what's going to happen, so try not to let what Booker has said in the past dictate what you think is going to play out in the future. There are a lot of moving parts, um, and of course, Booker's not the majority leader. Senate Schumer is. And then on to this one from Tim Seymour uh, from CNBC's Fast Money. A two-minute recap on why cannabis investing has catalyst to the upside uh, ahead of us. So we're just going to relay this so he can talked about this last week when we first got some sense that you could be pushing safe banking through a bill nobody expected. Uh, my friend Todd Harrison used the term spark in the dark. I, I think that's what this is, a headline that the industry didn't expect. Um, so to the extent that this is now the fifth time the House has voted through safe banking, not a big deal. The fact this moves on to the Senate um, doesn't necessarily compete with the Schumer bill that was so sure. comprehensive that it was too much for the Senate to pass and dead on arrival. But actually, this has room. And I think this is a bipartisan issue. Um, the other piece, uh, the important dynamic here is this, this is a piece of legislation that will move quickly. Um, that you could actually see safe banking towards the end of the year. So what does that mean? It doesn't open up exchanges. It doesn't open up all institutions into cannabis, but it, it, it gets it on a federal level in terms of banking and FinCEN. It gets momentum in a sector that really needs macro momentum at a time when the bottom up yes. has been very, very strong. So again, I, I think this is very exciting news. Uh, probability, I'll let other people do that on passage in the Senate. What it does show, though, is there's a strong constituency and a bipartisan support for uh, safe banking, which doesn't deschedule. Um, but if you listen to some of the companies that have come to market and been able to list on the NASDAQ, what's really interesting is that lending as a service is something that might be allowable in a safe banking environment, bringing more lenders, bringing more mm -hmm. capital. But you asked about the movement in the stocks because, again, people that have been following cannabis know that despite very strong profitability and bottom up, uh, sectors down 40%. Um, I, I think this is a case where, you know, at 12 times 2022 to 2023 EBITDA is a really cheap sector. And, and all you need is a little bit of a spark. So um, three day moves in some of these companies has been, you know, 15%. Um, oversold conditions. And as I said last week, it shows how spring loaded this sector truly is because the fundamentals are strong. All right. Well said, Tim Seymour. So thank you for that recap. Uh, and then we're going to jump over to this one from Toby Cannabis just to highlight and how we can think about these cannabis companies once they've been uplisted and once they are treated like any other company. After MSOs are uplisted, banks will likely pivot to targets based on sales and the amount of revenue that these companies are bringing in. Jeffries rationalizing buying CELH, which is a beverage brand called Celsius, valuation at 15x sales and 100x EBITDA. Celsius grew sales by 15 million quarter over quarter with 11% EBITDA margins. Same logic implies MSO's targets have significant upside. And so, uh, of course, that logic will only apply after <laughs> uplisting or some change allows these companies to be treated like others. But just to highlight 15x price to sales, and then they saw sales of 15 million growth quarter over quarter with 11% EBITDA margin. So if we go to the US Cannabis Investor Portal from MJ Stock Trader, thank you MJ Stock Trader for putting this together. I would say the most undervalued MSOs right now that you can get based on current value are Cresco Labs, TrueLeaf, and Verano. And right now, if we look at their full 2020 year, their market cap right now to their expected sales is a 3x price to sales. So again, if we just look at Jeffries valuing Celsius at a 15x, this would imply a 5x upside for these three MSOs uh, if the valuations stay the same for the numbers that they're going to put out uh, in revenue in 2020 alone. And then just to add to that, and if we look at the quarter over quarter revenue growth, Verano had the most of 39% quarter over quarter. TrueLeaf saw the least at 11% and then Cresco Labs saw 18%. But that's all Cresco going from 178 million in sales to 210 million in sales, which is over 40 million increase as opposed to just a 15 million quarter over quarter increase. And the last thing, EBITDA margins, we take a look. Verano's at 41%, uh, TrueLeaf's at 44%. Cresco Labs at 22% EBITDA margins, 
all better than 11% EBITDA margin here. So it's the same logic applies, highlighting that the undervalued opportunity in the cannabis space is real. It just requires patience. And I'm sure as you've noticed from all the stories I relay, you're probably seeing it more and more here and there as you pay attention to it. We're just waiting for that spark in the dark that sticks, and it is going to come. On to some news from BDSA as they report global cannabis sales surge 41% year over year in 2021 and will surpass 62 billion by 2026. BDSA announced today an update of its cannabis market fo- forecast, a five year rolling global forecast by country, state, province, channel, and category. Cannabis sales for 2021 will near 31 billion, an increase of 41% over 2020 sales. And this is further BDSA forecast global cannabis sales to grow from 30.6 billion in 2021 to 62. billion. 0.1 billion in 2026, a compounded annual growth rate of more than 15%. The cannabis industry continues to show exceedingly rapid growth, particularly within the U.S. market, said Kelly Nielsen, Vice President Insights and Analytics for BDSA. New markets, both medical and adult use, are developing at a faster pace than observed in the past, and states are transitioning to medical from medical only to fully legal in a shorter time frame. So we're going to recap the U.S. Uh, BDSA forecasts cannabis sales in the U.S. to surpass $24 billion in 2021, a growth of 38% over 2026 sales of $17.8 billion and anticipates the U.S. to reach $47.6 billion by 2026, compounded annual growth rate of 14%. Drivers in the U.S. include mature markets. In the U.S. continue to see strong growth during the first half of 2021. California, the largest cannabis market in the world, saw the largest gain of 25% growth, so still still growing like an emerging market. New markets are developing at an ever-increasing rate. Illinois and Massachusetts contribute more than double the spending in the first half of 2021 versus 2020, while Arizona became the fastest state on record to transition from medical only to adult use. And we have emerging markets ready to come online, waiting to drive growth in out years and are representative of the long-term trend. Emerging markets include Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, New Mexico, Virginia, and South Dakota. Well, if we look at Canada, sales in Canada will total $4 billion in 2021 and are forecast to grow to $6.7 billion in 2026, compounded annual growth rate of 11%. Ontario, the largest cannabis market in Canada, is spearheading this boost, growing by almost 90% year-over-year in 2021. While international markets, BDSA forecasts international sales will reach nearly $7.9 billion in 2021 up from $1.7 billion in 2021, as international sales continue to be driven by medical cannabis markets in Mexico, Germany, and the UK. While Canada has published their total recreational and medical sales for the month of July, setting another record of $338.8 million, up from $319.1 in June of 2021, and this is again mostly led by the growth in Ontario, our most populated province opening 120 stores a month, going from 120 in sales up to 126.6 million in sales. We also saw some strong growth out of Alberta, up to 60.6 million, British Columbia, 48.5 million, up from 44.3, and in Quebec, uh, up to 52.1 million, up from 49. That's their first month beating 50 million in sales. But again, if Quebec, province with 8 million people, opened more than 60 stores, they would see a lot more sales and be a lot more proud of themselves if they would dare to take that market share out of the black market and put it into a legal one. But on top of that, Tilray to announce first quarter fiscal 2022 financial results on October 7th, 2021. So this is less than two weeks away. And just a reminder that earnings don't stop. As this is an unfolding and dynamic issue, we're going to continue to see earnings from Canadian LPs, and US MSOs. US MSOs will come in November, but this is going to hopefully bring some more attention back to the space and hopefully Tilray can show some strong sales and market share from the growth that we have seen um, over the summer in Canada. On to some other developments, though, for Marijuana Moment. Uh, Marijuana Banking Sponsor discusses path through Senate after House approves reform for the fifth time. So this was an interview from Marijuana Moment with Ed Perlmutter, and I just wanted to highlight one thing because, you know, although I thought Ed was probably speaking with Chuck Schumer uh, and they were on the same page with all of this. Well, it turns out, obviously, yeah, politics uh, is just like real life and communication is not always there, as we suspect. So just want to highlight this. So uh, for Marijuana Moment, some key senators have said they aren't very excited about moving banking reform in advance of comprehensive equity-focused legalization. Have you been in touch with Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and colleagues about their latest thoughts on moving safe banking now through the NDAA while their broader effort to end prohibition is still pending? Well, Perlmutter responds, I have not. Okay, fair enough. I have a call scheduled with Raphael Warnock, who is sort of my counterpart in the Senate Banking Committee. He and I are going to talk about it. We've been in touch with the sponsors of the bill over there, Jeff Merkley and Steve Daines, to let them know what's happening, and obviously with my senators from Colorado. It was just last night that we were able to add safe banking as an amendment, and so no, I have not had the chance yet to talk to Senator Schumer or Booker about this. I don't think that a full legalization bill has been prepared yet. I don't know where they are on tracking votes, but I do feel pretty strongly that safe banking has substantial support in the Senate, and this gives another chance for it to be heard. And if that's what you wanted, Perlmutter, then good on you, because now at least SAFE has been heard, and it does have the bipartisan support. So if Schumer and Booker want to try and step in the way, 
It's not going to look good on them, so I commend you, Promutter, for taking initiative. And then just on top of that to add, more banks say they're working with cannabis businesses, or at least more banks see the risk worth taking as lawmakers plan to advance reform. Because if we take a look, the number of banks and credit unions reporting that they work with cannabis businesses ticked up last quarter, according to new federal data. And as of June 30th, there were 706 financial institutions that had filed requisite reports saying they were actively serving cannabis clients. That's up from 689 in the previous quarter, but still down from the peak of 747 in late 2019. So just to highlight though, there are about 4,000 uh, financial institutions in the US and over 5,000 uh, credit unions. So there's a lot more uh, cannabis business to be to be taken on by banks and credit unions, but just wanna add this as it seems like more people see this as a risk worth taking as some sort of legislation does appear to be on the horizon, you know, in the distant future. So just want to add, if more banks are willing to take the risk, they think some change is probably coming soon. And then on top of that, Governor Hochul announces appointments to Office of Cannabis Management Board. So we did see some development out of New York, as Governor Kathy Hochul today announced that Ruben R. McDaniel III and Jessica Garcia have been appointed to the Board of Office of Cannabis Management. The Cannabis Control Board and Office of Cannabis Management will create and implement a comprehensive regulatory framework for New York's cannabis industry, including the production, licensing, packaging, marketing, and scale the sale of cannabis products. New York's cannabis industry has stalled for far too long and I'm making important appointments to set the Office of Cannabis Management up for success so they can hit the ground running, Governor Hochul said. I'm confident Mr. McDaniel and Ms. Garcia will serve the board with professionalism and experience as we lead our state forward in this new industry. So thank you, Governor Hochul, and hopefully New York can get going sooner than later on that. Onto this, the Office of Medical Cannabis Use from Florida. We look at the past week. We can see Florida added 3,263 qualified patients, bringing their total count up to 615,886. A few stores were opened from MSOs. Harvest opened another one. So Harvest has been on a roll. And Liberty Health Sciences, which is their wellness, opens another two. So some companies continue to expand in Florida. As we take a look, break down the sales of milligrams of THC sold, milligrams of CBD sold, and ounces of smokable flour sold strong sales across the board as Floridians want their cannabis. On to this news from Cresco as they plan to acquire three high-performing Pennsylvania dispensaries. So let's take a look at the details here. Operational highlights. Cresco will acquire three operational Cure Pen dispensaries in Lancaster, Phoenixville, and Philadelphia. Cure Pen dispensary locations will be incremental and complementary to Cresco Labs' four existing Sunnyside dispensaries in Pennsylvania, and a retail platform that outperforms the average revenue per store in Pennsylvania. That's likely why they plan to acquire them. And the aggregate consideration amount for the transaction is equal to $90 million uh, and will be satisfied at closing through the payment of cash and stock. So nothing paid yet that will come at closing. The transaction will be completed on a cash-free, debt-free basis with a mutually agreed upon normalized target level of working capital. The closing of the transaction is subject to, among other things, the approval and receipt of all required CSE and regulatory approvals. But for the most part, $90 million for three dispensaries. When you take a look and break down how Cresco's dispensaries perform, their sunny side ones, um, they get the best bang for their buck out of a lot of the MSO. So it seems like they think they're getting a good deal here. And I know Charlie knows more than uh, than I do, and I let Charlie do what he has to do in order for Cre to set up Cresco Labs to succeed in the future. On to another article, seven cannabis stocks ready to light up the market this fall. Brought to you by InvestorPlace.com. And of course, this is not investment advice, but it's another place that you can start your investment research as they do provide a list of seven cannabis stocks that could potentially surge in the fall in this context. If you want to find more about why they might, you can read below, but they highlight Cureleaf, Cresco Labs, Tilray, Kronos, Grow Generation, Green Thumb Industries, Innovative Industrial Properties. And three of these four, Cureleaf, Cresco, Green Thumb, are the top tier MSOs, excluding Verano and Trulieve, of course. Now, of course, you can go and read below as to why they might be a good choice. But the other thing that these sites don't give you is a resource like MJ Stock Traders Cannabis Investor Portal, which gives you the data behind why they are fundamentally strong and also likely a good choice. But if you wanted to grab this, this will be below. Uh, and then lastly, just to highlight, if you can, try to reach out to your state representatives, not even that you need to call Booker or Schumer if you're not from New Jersey or New York. Honestly, if you take the time to put together a letter and send it to your state reps explaining why you support safe banking and why they should too, it can go a lot further than you're led to believe. And I think this is just more important. If you live in a state that is not legalized for adult use or recreational yet, but you have a medical program, this is where you need to have your vo you need to actually do something and get your voice heard because don't you want to be involved in this change so that when it actually happens you can say yes my effort went a long way as opposed to doing nothing and then when the change comes you can just be like well 
another part of history I just decided not to take part in. So this is just an example from MJ Stock Trader writing to Senator Warren, but like she's in Massachusetts, he's in Massachusetts where cannabis is legal for adult use and medical already. But again, if you're in a state that does not have any sort of adult use program, but they do have a medical, you could just be that extra bit that pushes them to, to be the change that we all want to see, hopefully. Whole idea is if you don't try, you'll never know. And then lastly, just wanted to share this. Uh, I was featured on the Dime podcast recently, so I want to thank Brian and Kellen for having me on. We talked about the history of cannabis um, and you know the direction that investing is going in and especially just the potential with this sector. So if you want to tune in, you can check that out. Um, and yeah, so just wanted to share this with you because much respect to Brian and Kellen for putting this podcast together. Uh, you know, we had a great time chatting about this stuff and you know just love talking cannabis. So hope you guys uh, get some value to this if you choose to tune in. And that is it for today's episode, folks. I want to thank you so much for tuning in, and I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned? I do apologize if I'm a bit all over the place, but let me know in the comments if you have any questions or concerns. Uh, That way I can try to address them as best as possible. But that's it for today's episode. So if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos, and I'll catch you on Wednesday for a midweek update. Have a great week, everybody.